Perfect. So I'm very excited to have our own Catherine Manning with us today. So Catherine is a registered psychotherapist through the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario and is an accredited music therapist with the Canadian Association of Music Therapists. She has practiced as a music therapist for the past 28 years and specializes in work at end of life. She has worked in Vancouver, Connecticut, and Toronto in palliative and hospice care, including Lionsgate Hospital, the Connecticut Hospice, and St. Michael's Hospital, as well as Bridgepoint Hospital. She currently works at Hospice Wellington in Guelph and in oncology with Wellspring Cancer Support Center in Oakville and online, where she runs the music therapy program for those living with cancer. She uses piano, guitar, harp, and voice as primary means of musical engagement with clients. So Catherine, I will pass over the presentation to you and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Vanita. Thanks so much. All right. I'm gonna just move it ahead. So that's not really, oh, okay, there we go. Working on my system here to make sure I can do it properly. So thank you for your patience. Uh, I have a fair amount of material to, to talk about today and to share with you. So um, sometimes I tend to get enthusiastic about this subject matter and may speak quickly, but I, uh, so apologies if that's, if that's difficult to follow sometimes, but I get, uh, I get excited and, and tend to speak quickly. But here is uh, the topic today. It's music in these times, friend, healer, dream weaver, how music therapy can support our path of wellness. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Benita, and I have worked for about 15 years with Wellspring. It's been a wonderful experience uh, at, at, in Oakville and then on the last couple of years online as well. So the beauty of the last two years has been being able to sing and be with people across the entire country, uh, from Vancouver all the way to the East Coast. We have somebody in our group from New Brunswick right now, as well as people from Alberta and Northern Ontario and London. It's just been an amazing experience. The silver lining of COVID has been the expansion of our ability to connect with each other across the country with Wellspring and, and have music be able to reach places so far that it hasn't been able to in person. So it's been great. Um, for some reason, it's not. There we go. All right, I'm just going to activate some music here, and hopefully I'm going to set the volume just so you can hear it, but also hear me speaking. All right, get that going. You can hear that. So I, I did a bit of harp recording a few weeks ago for something related to hospice, and I thought I'd put a little harp music underneath as I speak here. There we go. So this is just the introductory ideas around music as a healing art um, for, for eons. Since time immemorial, music has been an ancient solve. The first rhythm we've known is our mother's heartbeat. Uh, there are many theories that suggest that, that humans' early speech was actually sounds that were sung, not spoken. So, and we can hear that in children's communication. It's like a sing-song way of speaking. So music has really been part of our, our experience ever since the beginning. I'm just gonna move this volume down just a touch here. Since ancient times, music has also been recognized for its therapeutic value. So the Greek physicians used flutes and lyres and zithers to heal their patients. And they used vibration to aid in digestion and treat mental disturbances and to induce sleep. Aristotle, actually, back in 323 or in his lifetime, in his famous book, De Anima, he wrote that flute, flute music could arouse strong emotions and purify the soul. Back in, uh, actually in the late 1700s and early 1800s, there was a physician named Diogel, and he was the first person to study the changes in our blood pressure and our heart rate associated with music. So he had musicians come into his laboratory and studied the effects of their music on, on these patients. And he, studied, he wrote the first article about that way back then. And we've always used music to enhance our spirituality, to uh, marshal our energies towards uh, a cause, to express our love and to share our grief with each other. Music has been part of that process all the way through. As far as music therapy, uh, there's lots to be said about it, but I'll just summarize it that um, in, in our current context, music, has become, music therapy has become more of a career since the World War, the Second World War. What happened was 
the soldiers that were coming back from the wars uh, were afflicted with PTSD and the hospitals that they were staying in, they hired musicians to bring musicians into the hospitals to support people living with uh, the PTSD symptoms. And the musicians realized that there was a powerful effect happening from the music for these folks. And they realized they needed more training in order to have the capacity to hold the intense emotion that was present. So they did some study and that's where, that's the origins of music therapy as a clinical, clinical profession in, um, in North America. And uh, music therapy in Canada has been in action for the past 50 plus years, since the 60s. Uh, first training program was out in Vancouver and that's where I studied actually my training as well. So music therapy then is the use of music or music interventions facilitated by an accredited music therapist to affect change and to support healing. And this will look different depending upon which populations we're working with. For myself, I've, I've been very, um, connected to issues around oncology and end of life all the way through my profession for the past 28 years. And uh, that's where my home is in this profession. And I've also worked in long-term care as well at times. So I'm gonna move on to the next, next screen, but music therapy at Wellspring will now be the focus a little bit of what we're doing. So the journey of cancer, this is something that is familiar. The diagnosis has been described in some of my Wellspring groups, people describe it as a brick wall, you know? The diagnosis comes and there's this wall. Um, it can bring fear and destabilization, anxiety and emotional unrest. Complex logistics, life is much more complicated. Uh, how do the medical, all the appointments fit into our life? How do we deal with our children or our parents or our family system with all of the complexities that are now present that weren't there yesterday? It can be as simple and straightforward as that. Um, there's pain and discomfort affiliated with all of this. And then the necessary relationship changes that can happen. Um, people in the groups have often shared that they, their relationships changed with their friendships. Um, they were grateful for Wellspring because they felt uh, an affinity once they walked in the door and they felt people actually understood from the inside what they were experiencing. It's a very interior experience and a very lonely experience to be diagnosed. And so to feel that connection immediately with other people who've lived the same the same journey is very powerful and profound. Um, and so you're adapting to the changes within your life of friendships that shift or family relationships that are under strain. And the necessary existential and spiritual questions that come at this time as well are, are huge. So we find the importance of the aesthetic and beauty to be paramount, really important at this stage, and the power of the authentic presence. So recognizing that each moment uh, we can look at and approach with a sense of sacredness, a sense of wonder, a sense of um, the importance of the present moment becomes very, very clear at this time. And that's one of the things that music brings is its, its capacity to be, to offer immediate presence. Music and the whole person. They're the mind and the body and the emotion and the soul. Those are all components of our being, our whole person. Um, so it affects all of ours, our bodies, all of our minds and all of our emotions and our soul. Physically, physiologically, I think I spoke a little bit to that in the introduction around the measurement of the blood pressure and the respiration, and et cetera. Music does regulate, help to regulate our blood pressure, our heart rate and the respiration, and it helps in our parasympathetic nervous system. So they've done studies to show that when people are having painful procedures or recovering from surgery, the use of specifically preferred music, music that is familiar and chosen by the patient, that music becomes very powerful and can facilitate healing and, and can um, speed up recovery sometimes from surgery. And part of that is related to the endorphins and the stress hormones. So what happens with music is it resides in the limbic system of our brain. That's where it's seated, is in the limbic system, which involves a thalamus, hypothalamus, amygdala, all those parts of the brain that are in the subcortical region. And they are responsible for regulating our breathing, our body temperature, our moods, our appetites. 
So music can, and can activate and, and stimulate the limbic system. And then that affects our neurotransmitters. This is a bit of science, but I'll get into the other stuff in a minute. But um, the neurotransmitters uh, deal with dopamine and endorphins. So endorphins are those things that are the happy, happy chemicals and happy hormones that make us feel relaxed and, and at ease. So it releases those, it encourages the release of endorphins and it discourages the release of cortisol. It brings down the stress hormones uh, in our bodies. So that's part of the physiological piece that music can enhance. Um, in addition, there's something called the pain gate control theory. And that is uh, operating, they're doing all this amazing research. Uh, you can look up some research on music and medicine and the brain. And what's happening is that they're recognizing that the brain music activates all of the parts of the brain, not just one area. It, it can move and, and compensate from other areas. So if there's dementia present, um, the music can actually stimulate pathways and help to compensate. So people can remember things related to music that they can't remember in a normal situation. Um, it also interferes with the perception of pain because the music pathways share the neural pathways with our pain perception. So music can actually override or affect how we perceive or feel pain. Uh, so if you can listen to music that's really preferred and you can immerse yourself in when you're experiencing some pain, um, you'll find hopefully that the music can affect the perception of the pain and it allows you to immerse yourself and shift into another perception. So that's where the physiological components of music come into play. And then we go to the cognitive and cognitively music provides links to memory. So I'm gonna give you an example to highlight this. In my work with long-term care, there was a woman named Patricia and she had really advanced Alzheimer's to the point where she had, she couldn't remember her name. She couldn't remember her family members. She basically was not speaking anymore to, and she would lie in her bed all day. But when she saw me, she knew that I represented something um, fun for her or connecting for her. So she would follow, sit in the circle, and I would, I would sing songs with her from the 20s and 30s. Uh, this was a long time ago I worked with her. So, And um, she, what we find is that she would break into song, but not just any song. She would be singing with harmonies that were barbershop quartet harmonies. And if you know what I mean by barbershop, it's like very, very subtle, very chromatic harmonies, sophisticated harmonies that were coming out of her. And she remembered the words. And not only that, I would say things like, wow, Pat, what a beautiful, what a beautiful song you're singing. Tell me about it. And she would say, well, that's the song that I used to sing with my sisters when I was 17. We were in a barbershop quartet together. And so she remembered not only the song and the words, but the story that went with it, the connection she had with her sisters. And she also felt a sense of mastery. She felt very happy that she remembered. She felt the emotion of remembering something that was meaningful. Uh, and the nurses that would walk by the room would always stop and go, who's that, who's visiting? And so she felt that esteem of being, of being heard. Uh, her music was being honored and that was really beautiful. So that's the cognitive link. I find that over and over again, that cognitively it bypasses the neural, the frontal lobes, it can bypass and go into other parts of the brain and activate connection points for people with memory and emotion. Uh, emotionally then, our heart and our music. So when, uh, when we're, obviously when we're feeling, the, the first thing that happens when we sing a song often is, is tears will emerge. You know, I'm working at bedsides and, and people maybe not know what I'm gonna be doing with them. It's the first time experiencing music therapy at a bedside in hospice. And they've chosen a, chosen a song to, to listen to and to sing with me and immediately tears come and they don't know why. It's just, it just emerges. Again, it's that limbic system. Music resides in the same part of our brain as emotion and memory. And so they're all connected. But what happens with music in a therapeutic context is that there's a container that is supportive and holding so that the music and memory and emotion, it's not just, you're not just being flung into an emotion uh, without any support. You're being held, this song actually becomes a container for holding the emotion that comes with it. And if it's been being used in a skillful way um, with care, with somebody who's with you that's, that's caring, it can be a very healing experience. So that's, that's the goal. And then spiritually, well, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that too. This is pretty critical and key for the work that I do. So when people are facing cancer, they face the unknown. 
This can be physical and psychological, and it can be spiritual. It's all of these things. Music lives in the in-between places for all of us. It can stand between two worlds. We listen to a song and we time travel. It takes us back into another place. We find ourselves in a completely different emotional state. It can shift our moods. It can lift us up. Um, it can separate us for a moment from what we were just feeling and bring us into a new emotional state. Um, we find ourselves bonded with people immediately where we were just strangers, like on our Wellspring groups, we come in and some people are brand new to the group. Uh, within 10 or 15 minutes, they go, wow, there's something happening here. <laughs> there's, there's a sense of family, uh, a belonging that comes really easily and it's because of the power of music and the shared musical experience and the attention um, to what is underneath the music, uh, people's, people looking at each other and listening and supporting. Um, when people ask for a particular song, we are listening to what's behind the asking. We're listening to the story that comes with the request for the song. And we're also attending to the emotion that comes with the experience of the song. So all of those things come together to support our soul and our connection with each other on a spiritual level. So songs of our lives ask these kinds of questions. Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? Am I alone? How can I tell you all that you mean to me in this one singular unrepeatable moment? And that can happen through a song. What is it too soon for? What is it too late for? And what is it just the right time for? When you're very still in a place without words, steeped in silence, in the space between the notes, in the music, when the world is elsewhere with its noise and its worries, what are the deepest parts of you that echo? Who are we when we stop doing and when we start being? Music allows us a space to step into the being. And that's what I'm, what's what I really resonate with in this work. So I invite you to uh, continue with me as we follow through here. I'll share a bit more with you. So according to Mr. Rogers, feelings are mentionable and manageable. That's a quote that I just love. So Mr. Rogers honors our emotions. And in our culture and our fast paced life, it's really hard to sometimes hold on to that idea. But Mr. Rogers had it all together. Sometimes it's easier to address difficult feelings less directly, though. And so that's why music therapy can also support us in that. It's difficult sometimes to come at things right on the nose and to say exactly how we feel and express it. But sometimes music can provide that side door, that back door, that, that um, sideways look at something that is, it feels safer. So how can we use music purposefully and effectively to help us change the way we feel, think and behave through the right music at the right time in the right way for us? And it will be very distinct for each person. How can music unlock us? How can music hold us? How can music free us? How can music befriend us? How can music embolden us? How can music give us courage and fortitude? I'd like to share with you a little bit of this video. This is actually my stepfather, Nick Kayfler. He's given me permission to use this and he has advanced Parkinson's. And I have been visiting him in Ottawa when I can, as much as I can. and and starting to build a little library of songs because he is a, he's a singer and a choir conductor um, and was a baritone soloist for his whole life. And Parkinson's has, has attacked his vocal cords uh, related to the vocal uh, weakness of the muscles and his voice. Um, but we worked together on a song called The Impossible Dream. Uh, this was several months ago. He's given me permission to share this with you. I'm just gonna bring it up to this place and share a little bit of the song with you. The impossible dream to fight the unfightable foe to bear with unbearable sorrow to run where the way cannot go to right the unrightable wrong to be there.
So I just give you an example of somebody who's trying to use his voice as long as he can and, and the changes that he's experiencing, his voice is very different than it used to be. And he's mourning that, but at the same point, he's using the opportunity to um, bring presence to his gift uh, in the way that he can. And I, I wanna honor that for him. So music therapy and healing, this is, Another uh, one of my patients actually in palliative care at St. Michael's Hospital, his name is Stuart. And he was a philosopher, a painter, a poet, and he had a hundred songs in his mind that he had never written down or composed yet, but they were ready to compose. And so we worked together. We only had about two months together. And unfortunately he died of an aneurysm a couple of weeks before uh, we expected him to die. He had a, a sudden, a sudden embolism. So unfortunately, the song that we were starting to work on, the first of 100, uh, was only partially in the making. And so um, this, this is what he and I talked about a lot about was uh, was art and creativity and music and how it how it affects us. And this was a quote by him that he gave me permission to share at some point in the future. So I wrote I wrote it down. I said, Stuart, please repeat what you just said, and I wrote it down. So his idea about music it's just those songs that can unlock you. Sometimes you carry around a mind full of baggage that is really like an attic stuffed with bits of old furniture, some of it broken. This broken furniture takes your energy, it drains you. This is when you feel weighed down from life, from the things you have carried. In a river, when there is a log jam, usually there are only a few single logs that act like a boom, holding back thousands. It's good to let a few out, let the flow return. And that special music, whatever it is for you in your life, it, it can help with the release of those few logs, then the rest can flow free. And I think that's really profound, that idea that, um, if you find the music of your life specific to you, it can allow for greater flow uh, because it allows for things to shift, your emotions to shift and move and flow. So here we are, music therapy at Wellspring. And this picture up in the top corner is, uh, this is at Oakville, light up the night. And every year for many, many years, our music therapy support group would be asked to sing to right before the lights go on, we would bring bring up the lights with some songs. And you can see they're just glowing. It was a wonderful, wonderful energy in that group. And we would actually do caroling in, in the house. We would carol from room to room while all the different, the craft sale was going on, the book sale and all of the different rooms, we would sort of pop in and do little carols around the house, which was fun. Uh, and I'm just gonna go quickly through this screen. The, what's comprised of the group at Wellspring is the Therapeutic Song Circle um, and improvisation would happen in person with instruments at times with drums and various shakers. And we would do sort of one to, you know, in, in the moment improvisation. Uh, songwriting would evolve sometimes in our groups and the use of music and imagery. Sometimes I would give people pastels and paper and we would listen to classical music and I would bring people into a relaxation state and 
people would free image with their colors and um, art, art, art time basically with music and then share the imagery afterwards, which can unlock things in the subconscious quite, quite beautifully. We would often find that people would have similar images across the circle. They would image the same thing. And I feel like there was an energetic connection happening in there. Um, and also the light of the night, the community involvement would happen. So within the song circle itself, the notion here is that we each have a musical song print. Our, we have a fingerprint. This is my, my theory about, about music and us, that our song, our, our beings actually, um, have a musical backdrop to them. We, we all were raised by our, our parents and we had the songs of our mother that were running around outside the womb when we were inside our mom. And then we would come out and we'd hear the songs of our parents as we were growing up and the songs of our, um, our courting times in high school and early 20s. And then the songs we sang for our children. So our own lives have music that is unique to us, like as unique as a fingerprint. And so as a music therapist, my job is to come alongside people and, and accompany them on a pathway to rediscover what's the music of your life? What is the, what is, who are you musically? What is the soul print of your music, basically? Um, that's a powerful concept. Music of our lives brings deep connection to our personal identity. The shared experience of music dissolves boundaries and barriers between people. And when we share something, the load is lighter. So people often say with this cancer journey, my goodness, Wellspring, what a, what a gift. Even online, um, you can feel the sharing of it through the waves, <laughs> through the Wi-Fi. It's, it's being shared and the, latest, the load is lighter. Creative exploration. Human beings were, were born with a desire to create beauty, even in times of distress and dis-ease or disease. And uh, so we need to honor the, the, the desire to create beauty. One quick little story. When I worked in St. Mike's Hospital, there was a nurse who was in palliative care and she was dying on our unit. And we knew her well and we loved her. And, and um, one day she wanted me to have to, to do some music therapy with her, um, but she needed to use the bathroom first. And I had a meeting to go to. So she said, well, why don't you just come into the bathroom with me? Bring your harp and, and sit and just play. So I did. Uh, she sat and she had to be there for quite a while. So I just sat on a stool with the harp. We closed our eyes and I said, let's, let's go to Ireland. Let's go to an abbey in our minds. And we could see the green hills and the castle in the distance. And we closed our eyes and I played the harp and it echoed because the bathroom was really live sound and, and we really transported ourselves. So the idea that something as mundane as a bathroom in a hospital, which is very, you know, sterile, it's not the Irish abbey, but we basically created an atmosphere of the Irish Abbey, of a place other, a place of beauty and aesthetic, um, where, which we can honor that part of ourselves and that need for, for us to have that ability to, to go there, to go somewhere else sometimes. So we are all full of creative potential and this is a pathway for positive and shared growth. Within a little bit more detail within the support group structure, what I find in our, in our group, the most important thing is, is songs. It's communal singing. So we describe, we discuss the lyrics that come up. I often, I may ask people to think about were there lyrics that stood out for you, one line or an image that stood out for you in this, in this song today and why, or why would, why would somebody choose a song or request a song? Um, often there's a story that's very personal that goes along with it. Uh, one, one person this week requested in memory of her sister who had died several years ago um, in honor as sort of an anniversary memory of the time of her death, they requested the circle game for her. And it was a beautiful emotion of uh, a, poignant, a poignant moment of emotion for the entire group to just group to hold her, her, her story and her memory of her sister at that time. And then use while we were singing the song, um, allowing the words of the song to filter in recognizing that now the child is 20 comes along in that song and she had mentioned that her sister's son was 20 years old so it allows us to follow the track of somebody's life and make it really meaningful um, for somebody to experience that care so communal singing is really really key songwriting sometimes comes up we may sometimes go well we need another verse to the song it's not long enough and so we'll have a flurry of people will put together ideas for another verse and then we don't do that often enough i think we need to do a bit more of that actually it's really fun when that happens 
The sharing of individual talents, that's a beautiful thing that's unfolded. We have several, so many people of, with talent in our group and when they feel comfortable, it's never expected, but it's always welcome. Um, often, usually after our halfway break in the second half of our session, there may be some people that feel brave enough or feel like they wanna share. Sometimes they sing. We've got a couple that's on there that sings duets for us on a regular basis. In fact, they always sing our closing, closing song to finish off our evening. Um, and then somebody else who plays hammer dulcimer and somebody plays harp and it's, it's just lovely to, and somebody else plays the harmonica. So it's lovely to just welcome the different talents in as they feel comfortable. Uh, also the sharing of meaningful pieces of music. When we met in person, people sometimes would bring in a CD and actually share a piece of music that we could all listen to and then hear the context of that story. Um, and I talked about music listening with, with pastels and sketching and guided imagery and music, and then also the improvisation, but that's only in the live context. So what happens in our group, uh, we, with currently with online on Zoom, is I sing with guitar and then everybody else mutes so that they can sing as loudly as they'd like in their own home space and can sing harmonies with me, uh, whatever they like, uh, but they can hear, hear properly because with Zoom there's a time delay. So by muting, it allows, allows for you to sing along freely with me while everybody can do the same from their own homes. It works well. All right, so what happens in the circle? Just to summarize, music is mystery. It transcends language. Uh, songs, that should be S-O-N-G-S, -S. songs emerge in the group and often they become what we need them to be. They kind of morph and shift. So I think that songs are like shapeshifters. And when we hear a song that we may have heard many, many times in our life, like John Denver, Take Me Home Country Roads, uh, sometimes in a, on a certain day, you'll hear it a different way. Mm -hmm. Or in our group together, people will often say, well, I've never heard the words that way before. I never noticed the words before. And it means this for me now. And it, it's very unique, right? So songs have an ability to shift and change. Something quite magical happens in the group itself. Music strikes chords in each member differently. And then they see one another experiencing the song. Something be begins to grow that connects us all together, like a golden thread of sympathy and compassion. Distance shrinks between us, warmth and openness opens, we're, we're sharing a resonant space. Songs come with stories and when they're shared, they bring empathy from others and a sense of belonging. There's abundant kindness and gentle humor. We laugh a lot. And it's a safe space where all emotion is held and supported. Whoops, back up. Uh, here's an example of a song that we wrote together. This was way back, this was like maybe 12 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, called River of Life. And what I did was I invited everybody in the circle in person to uh, put, put down a phrase or two of what Wellspring, what, what it means to live with hope at this time with their cancer journey and, uh, and what Wellspring, sort of like hope and Wellspring, what, what comes up for them. So they put little phrases in and then I took the phrases home and I created this song. Uh, I'm not going to sing it for you because it'll, it'll be long and I need to keep rolling, but you can see you can see the imagery that comes. River flowing free, carrying sorrows to the sea. Come along, cast your cares aside with me. We are breathing life anew, ever-changing hue. Bring your song, sing the many and the few. So you can see that it's a creative endeavor, this whole thing. And another song that we, we did actually together in a circle, we wrote this together. The... Um, we come together, the singing circle to raise our spirits high. I actually kind of forget the tune, but um, this was something that we worked on together and it was really exciting to repeatedly, repeatedly sing it over the course of our sessions until the sessions ended. And once in a while, I bring it back again. All right. One of our members uh, who's been with me actually in person and on Zoom, Lynn, has been with the music therapy group for probably, I'm thinking six years, maybe at least. Um, <clears throat> she actually quoted, she spoke um, in December to our group online about what music therapy meant for her. And I'm going to just read this for you. The song Guiding Light. The first time I heard it, it was just after Wellspring had shut down because of COVID and Catherine realized how much the Wellspring music sessions meant to our group, especially during COVID when we were all so scared. She started recording songs and sending them out every Friday evening. It was like a lullaby before we went to sleep. So one night I'd had a really tough day. My husband had a neurological disease and I was his full-time caregiver. It was really hard to see him deteriorating. 
I was so exhausted emotionally and physically. I remember lying in bed that night thinking, I don't know how I can get through another day of this pain. <clears throat> then I remembered that Catherine had sent an email with a few songs. I lay on my pillow, listened, and it just spoke to me of exactly what I was going through. The phrases, the road is long. I could picture my husband. I could, everything in it, the way that I felt the weakened tree, which was to me, my husband, it just spoke of how much further there was to go. And at that moment, I wasn't full of hope, just full of despair. The song, I think, gave me this permission to feel that it's okay. You're not the only one going through this. And at the same time, it gave me hope too. When I heard it, the words, my guiding light brought me back home. At that moment, music therapy was my guiding light and bringing me back to where I should be. Normally, I'm an optimistic person, but, and I was grateful for all the time that Doug and I had together, but I just lost my way at that time. And then I focused on our music sessions and about how supportive everyone is and how we all just need each other. And I responded, I, maybe I'm losing a little bit of that line there. There can be hope and also permission to feel that it's really uh, something, and it's possible for those things to both exist at the same time. Um, that the road is really long and wide, and the darkness is very present to you, but at the same time, there is hope. And I think I was talking about that there's, you can hold both the hope and the darkness in tension. There's a beautiful tension that you can hold them in, um, especially when you feel the connection of one another and music to help you with that. Another person in our group has kindly shared this with us. This is a poem that she wrote. Um, she wrote this poem several months ago and shared it with me initially and then has read it a few times actually on, uh, on our session together. So this was her perception of the music group. I call this my group, the faces I see each week. We've never met. We know not each other's stories, but that doesn't matter. You do. As I look into your faces, you are my heroes. I see your compassion, your strength, your perseverance, your humor. I hold on to that when I feel I don't have anything left. The music lifts us to places we can only dream about. Maybe it brings back a story, another song, or maybe we just sit back and enjoy its melody. Maybe it brings a silent tear or stirs something deep within us, and that's okay. It's held here, even if only for a short time. We don't have to carry it alone. Whether it's remembering every night to look upward, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, thanks Zachary. Listening to the hammered dulcimer, violin, harmonica, or the voices that grace us with song, they bring music to our lives. The invisible silver thread that connects us, we walk alongside each other wherever we are in our journey, even for the short time we are together. We see what the human heart spirit can do. I thank you for even in all the times we have been broken, beautiful art is being made from the pieces. You are the beautiful pieces. I think that's an exquisite example of creativity. And um, I really thank Joanne for letting me share that with you today. The reference to Zachary was, there was a little son of one of our group members who um, he would always come on at towards the, when he was about to go to sleep, he was about seven or eight years old and six or seven, and he would come on and sing Starlight, Star Bright to us before he went to sleep and giving us his little blessing, which was wonderful, his own version of his own song. All right, thank you. Other quotes about reflections about the group. Music therapy has helped me relax and cope with my cancer. It's given me self-awareness, like getting tuned into my body. That's a beautiful phrase. This program has helped me emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Music helps me de-stress and makes me happy. Music energizes and invigorates my entire body. And I'll say something about that. So at the end of our sessions in Wellspring in Oakville, we would often say, everybody check the backs of your hands because at the end of the session, our veins would all be standing up and pronounced and protruding. We would all have like, so it would show how music had invigorated our circulatory system and, and sent our blood flowing more strongly, opened up our veins, um, which is physiological proof that it's doing something to our bodies. Music therapy helps me heal my emotional pain and makes me happy and energetic. I'd like to take a little bit of time now too, to move into music and you. How do you use music in your life? These are questions to just think about for yourself. And perhaps 
this will be on a recording so you can come back to this and I would invite you to, to revisit these screens that are coming up with questions because these are actually things that I'm going to start doing more with our group as well. I'm going to I'm going to engage with our group in questions around these these issues and these ideas. How do you use music in your life? When have you listened to music over this last month? How are you using music therapeutically in your life right now? It could be different than when you just use music in your life to sort of as a backdrop to what you're doing to cooking. How do you use it therapeutically? If you're not using music right now, why do you think that is? And sometimes that's, that happens. For some people, when they're in deep shock or in deep grief, music feels almost too much. It can be, I, I totally honor that, that there's a time where we feel really raw and really exposed because of a shock or because of a grief. Uh, one of my friends lost her child to cancer at four and she said she felt like she had no skin on. Uh, her skin was gone. So she really had a hard time going outside and listening to music was impossible for several months. Um, other people use music right away to support them, but everybody's different and we need to honor and respect people's differences. If music no longer existed, where and when would you miss it the most in your life? And now I'd ask you to think about three words. This, this little exercise comes from Jennifer Buchanan, who's a music therapist in Canada out in Calgary. So imagine all the music in your life right now and consider the three best words to describe it. These could be adjectives like bluesy, busy, folksy, energetic, any of these kinds of words or others that you might have. What are three words that describe your music of your life when you look at on the whole or even just right now? So if you take a moment and think about that, come up with three, and this can be something you do on your own time. And the follow-up question I would ask for that would be, if it, if it weren't describing music, but it was actually those three words were describing you, how does that fit? So it kind of shows maybe that your choice of adjectives to describe your music are quite aligned with how you are yourself and how you perceive yourself to be. Um, so for me, I think I, when I did this exercise, one of the words was atmospheric. My music was atmospheric, melancholy, and uh, I forget the third, meditative, I think. So that was describing Maybe the, the mood I was in that day, or maybe the mood I'm in generally right now in my work. So, so it can be whatever it is, and it could just be a highlight of this moment in time for you, or it could be something that's sort of more overarching and that you, you know, like I, my music is energetic and jivey and whatever, and this is sort of like, this is your big way you, way you are in the world and music aligns with that. Um, so just an interesting, interesting little exercise to consider to do. Um, along, further along those lines, your earliest memory of music. What was your very first album? That's kind of a quintessential question. Your first album that you spent money of your very own on. For me, uh, I think it might have been Sean Cassidy, but maybe even more so it might have been Grease because I had a big crush on John Travolta. I had a big poster of him. In fact, my stepfather, Nick, that you saw on that video, he bet me $20 when I was eight years, 10 years old that I would would not feel the same way about John Travolta when I was 25. And I said, no, 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 I'm always gonna love him just that much. I'm gonna love him forever, just that much. And, and I bet him $25 or something and I owe him the money, but um, it was a fun, a fun exercise because the power of you know, your, your first musical crush, that's a pretty strong thing. So what was your first album? How did it make you feel? What have your strongest musical, musical influences been? For me, Joni Mitchell. Carol King, those have been my strongest ones because those are the ones that my mom was playing. The ready, record player in the 70s was running those James Taylor and Carol King and I'd lie on the floor and listen to those. Everybody has their own, right? That they were, they were influenced by. Um, and does, it, does your special song have a visual association, a memory, or maybe another sense? Do you smell something when you hear a certain song? If you could go to one live concert after all these COVID months and months and months, what would it be? What would be the live concert that you would go to and why? And what music ties you to the closest person that you love? These are all questions of meaning related to music that are interesting to consider. So music during difficult times. I'm aware of the time. I'm gonna look at my clock. We have about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna to try to whiz through this. 
familiar music is really important. That's the comforting music, basically the mother music. You know, when you think about something that holds you and cradles you, this is familiar music that grounds us in what we know and who we are. It's it's our essential identity. It, it kind of roots us and grounds us. It's the music we wanna, um, if we're curled up in a fetal position and we're frightened, this is the music we wanna hear. New music, on the other hand, can increase our flexibility, our creativity, and can bring in fresh air. It can carve new neuronic pathways in our brain. So sometimes we like to challenge ourselves to listen to a song we don't know before. You know, sometimes in my group, I bring songs to the group that people haven't heard, and I invite them to experience something new. And usually, uh, people are quite open to that and and find and if there can be a connection point to that song then we can build a connection in for them right away and then we can revisit that song later music that soothes it relaxes the mind it lowers cortisol it increases endorphins anchor songs music that connects us meaningfully to others so this idea of an anchor song i'm going to give you an example when i worked in palliative care there was a family a, a man was dying he was close to death his family was all gathered around and the music that they shared as a family was music from church but not normal church only went to the, they went to the cottage in the summer and that's the only time they went to church was when they went to the cottage they went to a little country united church sang hymns together. So their singing as a family was church hymns from the cottage that was all linked to this time of, of time together, recreation, play, um, and just fun. And so what I did with that was at the bedside of this dying man, I found the hymns that they had sung together at that country church. And it was really unique to a specific set of memories for them. So I anchored their experience with their loved one to a time of familial connection and bonding so that whenever they thought of their loved one and they missed him, they could think of those songs or they could think of the song and then have the connecting point to the good times with the family, but also that time of leaving. When he was leaving at the bedside, he was dying. They had this beautiful shared memory of strength and connection between them to help them with that bereavement process. It was already doing some bereavement work at the bedside through the anchor song. Music to socialize. We like to move and dance and flow and shift and music brings our ability to just loosen up and share good moments with each other. And another important part of music is the silence. It's that time between the notes. It's the time without music. It's the time without any sound. It's an important component of our soundscape where we can tune into our own interior song. We can start to listen to what's our earworm. What is the song that's in our own mind coming from our experience today? Or what if the, we just need quiet? What if we need to listen to some birds? That's a different kind of music that we that we need to listen, that we need to tune into sometimes. So I invite you to think of a song of choice that you have for lifting your mood or energizing, and a contrast, a song of choice for grounding and settling. Those are two contrasting songs that you might think about for your own self right now in time. It's going to shift. It may not be your whole lifetime, it may be just for today. A song of each of those types, just for thinking about. And the idea of a life playlist. When I work one-to-one -one with people, this is a really powerful concept that you consider the notion of your personal life playlist. What might it contain considering your early, young, middle and later years? If you broke down your life into a decade at a time from zero to 10, what were the songs that I was being exposed to and what meaning do they have for us? And likewise, for each decade thereafter, it's a re rich mining resource for life, life reflection, for memory, uh, basically like looking through a, a photo book, but a music photo book of your own life. Because so much happens in our music space. All of the ages of your life are still in you. As you awaken those ages and feelings that were part of those ages, there are often memories in rooms looking for places of connection. Music, and in particular these songs, provides a bridge to those waters of feeling and memory. So music is a bridge. That's essentially the strongest metaphor I have for music. It's a bridge to one another. It's a bridge within ourselves to our inner self, uh, to our interior realm, basically. So. I am aware of the time and I have a number of songs here with lyrics and I would be happy to sing 
a song or two before we go. I know you have questions. What we're thinking of is taking, taking time all the way to the top of the hour and question and answer could happen right at one so that um, if you do have a burning question, that would happen then. But I wanna maximize the time for experiencing this music together. Um, and I'll show you quickly what else is here. Other songs, we have All I Have to Do is Dream. I Have a Dream. Three Little Birds. Hallelujah. I Can See Clearly Now. And then our last song, this will definitely be one that I'm going to play. I've got a recording of it here. Uh, this is the song we always end with in our group at the end of each session. And I've got a recording to play for you. It's now 12.53, so we have time for one song of these songs. I will look in the chat, and the first person that calls the song that they'd like to have, um, please let us know if you have a song request from these songs that I've just shown you. I'm looking at the chat. Dream. Which dream? I have a dream? Yes. Okay. That's the one. <clears throat> okay. I'm in a corner in my in my living room. So here we go. <clears throat> Linda asked for all I have to do is dream. Okay, I'm sorry. Linda was first, so I'm going to have to do that one. If we have time for more, I'm more happy to do more, but let's just do that one because it was a special request. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Is I'm going to move ahead to, thank you for the suggestion, it's lovely. I'll move ahead to this final one here and let you hear what, this is the song we always finish with and this one it will include some harmonies. So you can hear the harmonies if you're in our group and you've always wondered what do the harmonies sound like with this song, this is what they sound like and you can add them next time you join us singing. So here we go. Could anyone ever tell you You were anything less than beautiful How could anyone ever tell you You were less than whole How could anyone fail to notice That your loving you Could anyone else? 
How could anyone ever tell you you were less than home? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul? So that's actually, that's the session right there. That's my sharing. And I, I thank you so much for your attention, uh, for your time. I have no idea how many people are here, but uh, I, I'm used to speaking to people where I see faces and I'm responding to people. So it's been a little odd to speak to my own picture. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them at this point. I'll let Vanitha come on and I'll stop sharing. I think that's what I'll do. That makes sense. And let Vanitha come on. Should I do that or should I leave yes, the screen? You can do that. Okay. Perfect. So thank you so much, Catherine. That was such a beautiful and inspiring, like it was so informational, but it was so moving just how important you stressed and emphasized music is in healing. And it was so, so beautifully expressed. Like I, I got a little emotional even hearing your anyone, um, that last song that you were saying, mm -hmm. it like gave me goosebumps. So I know like it brought the same feeling for everyone who is online. So just a huge, huge thank you for your time oh, today. You're most welcome. It's, it's a, a labor of love for me. So thank you for, thanks for those kind words. And that song actually comes from, um, I, when I first heard it in a women's march, actually, and in a demonstration. And it was, sing, oh. it was sung women to one another in, a, in an affirmation, sort of a chant. And so I started bringing it to the end of our group in Oakville. And it's been mm -hmm. running as our final song for years. Like literally this past seven years, we've sung it at, to end every single session. Mm -hmm. And it That's never beautiful. fails to make people feel really comfortable and affirmed and loved. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that it, it was so beautiful and you did Thank such you. a beautiful job oh. the recording is beautiful as well thank you so much yeah